Chapter 11, The Party, Communist Rituals and the Communist Jokes. The party is the mind, honor, and conscience of our epoch. Lenin. My first strongest, most enduring image of Soviet communism was the long line in Red Square, the people waiting for hours for a glimpse of their entombed saint, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. Newspaper pictures have made that orderly key of Russians, their passive peasant faces reflecting a patient's bread of centuries, and their voices hushed by a vast expanse, seem familiar even to those who have never been to Moscow, but the pictures do not begin to capture the mood or meaning of that pilgrimage to Lenin, the central ceremonial obligation of Soviet political life. One gray November morning, I joined the pilgrims. The line already led across Red Square, ran down a gentle slope beside the historical museum, turned a corner through iron gates, passed the eternal flame for the unknown soldier, and rambled on for nearly a hundred yards, before it dribbled away somewhere in the gardens beneath the towering fortress walls of the Kremlin. It was a cold day, everyone was in overcoats, hands in the pockets, arms hugging the sides. When our part of the line reached the well-guarded police barrier at the foot of the hill, with the mausoleum still out of view, police and plainclothes men straightened out the column and paired us off in twos. After we passed through the barrier, guides began collecting women's handbags to be returned later. Except for this one long human column, Red Square was swept clear of humanity, like a great coliseum before the spectacle begins. Its emptiness heightened the air of expectancy, imposed a sense of order and discipline. I was among a group of East German tourists, though my marching march partner was a tall, blonde Russian woman. We talked in respectfully quiet voices as we walked. The column marched us across the cobblestones straight toward St. Basile's Cathedral and then abruptly in the middle of the square made a sharp 90-degree pivot toward the linen mausoleum. At the pivot, the visual contrast between those two Russian shrines was startling. First, the chaotic beauty of St. Basile's with a kaleidoscope of colors exploding on its onion, pineapple, and cone-shaped domes, and then the low, sober, unembellished, rectangular, red granite dignity of the mausoleum. Here were two sides of the Russian spirit, the exotic and the austere, and Stalin had nearly eliminated one when he threatened to raise St. Basile's. Along our path, we had passed several policemen, but as we approached the pivot, I caught sight of the blue shoulder boards and collar tabs of uniformed KGB troops posted every few feet. Instinctively, my Russian companion and I stopped talking. Others in the line grew still. Wordlessly, one guard in a military greatcoat reached into the line and physically reversed a couple to put the man on the right and the woman on the left. Most other pairs were already that way. He wanted perfect uniformity. A few steps further, another guard vigorously motioned me to take my hands out of my pockets. We made the pivot. Suddenly, the man in front of me, a dark-haired Russian, was jerked out of line by an officer. What's that? The officer demanded, gesturing to a bulge under the man's overcoat. Nothing answered the Russian, just a package. It's forbidden, the officer commanded. You must leave, and he pointed across the square to the exit where we had come in. Like a master expelling a stray dog from the yard, the Russian's friends, the woman beside him, and the woman next to me looked crestfallen, but no one protested. I don't know whether they knew, for the news had been hushed up, that a bombing had taken place at the mausoleum some months before, killing at least three people. A plainclothes man came over and made the Russian, already a step or two out of line, take out the worrisome package, 
The line began bunching up, to the consternation of both guards and tourists. The plainclothes man felt the package, a long slender object, wrapped in shot paper. What is it? he inquired. A child's toy, said the Russian. Sheepishly, I just bought it. Okay, let him go, the plainclothes man told the uniformed soldiers. Then to the Russian, he said, carry it openly in your left hand, down like this, and he handed back the package. The Russian had to run to catch up with his friends, who had shuffled along. No running ordered another guard. Behind me, I could hear a plump lady from Leipzig whispering sarcastically to her companion, Tis Tisk, the discipline. By then, we were approaching the mausoleum steps. Guards were instructing men to remove their hats and making more checks. Another soldier found a bump in an East German's coat. The line hesitated. It turned out to be only a pair of gloves, and the line moved on. We passed between two immobile honor guard sentinels, gleaming bayoneted rifles held in rigid salute, and entered the mausoleum. Immediately ahead, a KGB officer directed the column to the left. We were moving quite rapidly now, or so it felt in the cool black marble interior. Left, then right, down two flights of stairs, and right into the main crypt room. At every turn was an armed, uniformed guard. All kept the column of visitors under close surveillance. The nearer we got to Lenin, the more intense the scrutiny became. In the crypt room itself, I counted at least thirteen armed guards, four with fixed bayonets at the corners of the brightly lit glass coffin in which Lenin lies, others at strategic points. The column made a swift circuit around the coffin. The crypt room is constructed so that visitors enter immediately, turn right, and walk up half a flight of steps along the wall, turn left and walk along another wall on a balcony overlooking the glass tomb of Lenin, turn left again and ascend another half a flight of stairs, and exit the room. This semicircular route permits a view of Lenin from both sides and from the feet but never at closer than 10 to 12 feet, and never within an instant to pause and simply look. While we made our circuit, one guard reached out and pulled a woman firmly by the arm, evidently because she had strayed minutely from the prescribed path. Like the others, I was so busy climbing and descending the stairs, watching out not to bump into the sentries or other tourists, that I had little chance to study the figure, to decide for myself whether the body was really the well-preserved remains of Lenin himself, or as Russians privately suggest, the work of some expert waxworks. For all the immense impact Lenin has had on the course of history, he looks remarkably small, lying there in a black suit with a black and red tie. His face and hands, the only visible parts, do look waxy. They show a yellowing and a slight darkening, but otherwise reflect none of the vicissitudes of the half-century since his death, including the transportation of the mummy to Kwaibi Shev during World War II when Nazi forces threatened Moscow, and what are said to be annual rejuvenations by skilled Soviet undertakers. Even after we had gotten our fleeting glimpse of Lenin, the vigilance did not relax. Mutely, we mounted two more flights of stairs. The line was unbelievably quiet, yet still I heard a KGB guard insistently shush people behind me, not until we got outside and men began putting their hats back on that I feel as though I could breathe normally again. The Germans were muttering in surprise about the rigid discipline. My Russian companion wanted to know my impression. I told her that I had never seen such a strict regimen such intense scrutiny at any other memorial. American memorials are usually open, I said, and in Paris at Napoleon's tomb, I noticed that visitors were led in by groups and were respectfully silent, but without such vigilant security. Well, you see, she replied, that is how we guard our Vozid, supreme leader. She was not defensive as Russians usually are at such comparisons, and I thought I detected a trace of irony in her tone, 
but she did not smile, obviously, or give any further clue that she too regarded it all as vastly overdone until we were passing the graves of Civil War heroes and former leaders like Stalin, where the security was much less forbidding. Then was a little nudge and a twinkle in her eye she quietly observed. So you see, it is more relaxed now. It is a commonplace to describe Soviet communism as a secular religion, but to me that insight had the power of renewed discovery. When I first came face to face with the full force of the Soviet cult of Lenin, Kremlin leaders resort to a constant, almost mystical incantation of Lenin's name as the source of legitimacy for whatever policies they pursue. Lenin was the founder of the state, the maker of the revolution, the shaper of history, and we follow his course. Lenin was a colossal genius, a fountainhead of wisdom, who foresaw how socialism would develop in our country and extend into other parts of the world. And we carry forward his struggle. Lenin was a humane, kind, considerate uncle with a captivating smile, a warm laugh, a simple, modest style of life, the father of a human, humane society that we make better each passing day. Whether it is trade with the West, warnings about ideological penetration, construction of electric power stations, slogans about importance of the press or movies, or observations on nuclear war, which Lenin did not foresee, though quotations from Lenin are stretched to claim that he did. Lenin is cited as scripture for today's actions in a political system which denies the existence of Khrushchev and sidesteps the importance of Stalin. Legitimacy is derived from one man, Lenin. It is the Leninist creed on which rest the infallibility of the Communist Party and its leaders. In terms of public symbolism, Marx is strictly secondary. Just how secondary I was reminded one night when an American diplomat organized a scavenger hunt, which required a couple of dozen participants to find a small bust of Marx, among other things. Little busts of Lenin are on sale all over Moscow. Even statuettes of Turgenev or Tolstoy, but some of us could find a bust of Marx on sale, but none of us could find a bust of Marx on sale. One Marx replica was unearthed, a plaque of Lenin, Marx, and Engels together, borrowed from a foreign ambassador, but Moscow store clerks were puzzled by anyone wanting a bust or figurine of Marx. We never have them. One surprised clerk told me, no one asks for them. By contrast, Lenin is a ubiquitous icon. The veneration of his bodily remains is reminiscent of the worship of the relics of saints in Christendom and Islam. The effort to perpetuate the illusions of immortality by preserving his remains in the mausoleum is another obvious parallel with religion. Secular shrines to Lenin, modest or gigantic, are omnipresent in Soviet life, sown like seeds from on high across the full length and breadth of this enormous country. The main square of every city is dominated by a statue of Lenin leading, exhorting, declaiming, gesticulating, or striding boldly into the bright future. No government office is complete without a portrait of Lenin, writing, studying, thinking, and above all, guiding. A gold-painted linen figure greeted the children every morning in the hallway of our neighborhood school. Factories, institutes, apartment buildings all have their red corners, often dreary little rooms with slogans and charts and photos grouped around linen. They draw upon the old Russian tradition of placing icons of Christ the Virgin and Church Saints in the corners to pray to, either because the party understood that Russians are by nature a deeply religious people and decided to turn that trait to the party's purposes, or simply because Russians instinctively 
put their new saint in the corner when they converted from one religion to another. At the Lenin Museum in Moscow, just off Red Square, party researchers and propagandists have assembled more than 10,000 pieces of Lenin memorabilia in 34 huge exhibition halls, filling a grand old high-ceilinged three-story building. I have seen school and university students are taken there in groups, not so much for excursions as for indoctrination sessions. The museum has a number of intriguing exhibition exhibits. The first printing press of Iskra Spark, Lenin's underground revolutionary newspaper, the false-bottomed suitcases, hollow children's blocks, and inner seams of dresses in which Iskra was smuggled into Tsarist Russia. Lenin's black Rolls-Royce roadster, his red wig, and other parts of his disguises, his silver-handled cane. But these are not the exhibits to which the lecture guides direct attention. They concentrate on reading underlined selections of Lenin's writings, his letters, his newspapers, his instructions to subordinates, his calls to action. Clichés of revolution abound, class struggle, vanguard of the working class, party of a new type, the Bolsheviks win. I watched several groups of bleary-eyed youngsters go through two hours of this non-stop. Lecturing and then numbed into silence, disappear in an instant when the guide cut short the tour after only 17 rooms and dismissed them. Practically every town has some facsimile of the Lenin Museum. Once in far-off Siberia, among the Yakuts, a people who resemble Eskimos, I visited a village school where a teacher proudly took me to the linen room. Her favorite display was a creche of the hut where linen had supposedly been born, made by some children. In Tadzikistan, the builders of the giant Nurik Dam used their first spark of electricity to light a mountaintop sign, Lenin is with us. Banners in Leningrad proclaim, Lenin lived, Lenin lives, Lenin will live. A ubiquitous slogan hung from rooftops or painted on signs along the roads like Jesus Saves, billboards in the American South. The Lenin cult reaches a climax on November 6th the eve of the anniversary parade celebrating the Bolshevik seizure of power. On that evening, 6,000 members of the Soviet elite gather in the Kremlin Hall of Congress for a ritual celebration, a televised speech from one of the Politburo leaders, and an all-star variety show with fragments from the Bolshoi Ballet, operatic solos, baritones singing patriotic anthems and lively folk dances in national costumes. But after the speech and before the entertainment, there is a reenactment of the sacred revolution, Donna la Azenstein, <clears throat> shots of linen, flash on a huge movie screen along which scenes of the assault on the winter palace of the Romanov czars. Lenin leaps about like a figure in a speeded-up silent film, ceaselessly commanding the masses, fanning their fervor, lighting the very fire of revolution. The battleship Potomkin fires its salvos. Red troops rush the palace. The Bolsheviks win. The year 1917 gives way to 1930 on the screen. A chorus in work clothes chants revolutionary songs of labor, while films of construction teams, welders, armies of cranes, <clears throat> trucks, dam builders reenact the feverish industrialization period. Next, 1941, photos of World War II, stacks of Molotov cocktails, rifles are passed out to recruits. 
troops and tanks parade in the snow through Red Square and race from the parade directly to the front to stem the Nazi tide menacing Moscow. Children dig Moscow defenses. <clears throat> Winter troops clad in white scramble into battle. By now, another chorus, all in helmets, chants Red Army songs. Flares burst in the sky, the victory parade. As the climatic moment approaches, a barrel-chested bass back, bass backed by a large choir roars out in song. Ford communist solo <clears throat> and the echo by the chorus a dozen times. Ford communist. As the lights go on, the huge stage is filled with probably 2,000 singers. Men in black suits, strong, full-throated, and bursting with power. The women in pleated, full-length white gowns, like a forest of Corinthian columns. And children in the white shirts and red scarves of young pioneers. It is a truly massive chorus. Beside it, the Mormon Tabernacle Choir pales like an octet, and with this vocal phalanx in full voice, the spotlights throw great shafts of light on a magnificent white statue of linen, which has glided to center stage. The chorus roars like the seas of eternity, linen gleams. One hand in his pocket, an open book rests on his other arm. Human reincarnate, the white purity of the statue projects the resurrection. It is truly a religious moment, intended to awe and inspire, to revive faith among those grown hard, cynical, or forgetful. It is a communist sacrament, of course, but it suits the Russian character, for Russians love Grandoy's theatrics. The stagecraft is very effective. Not only Westerners, but Russians themselves see this as a religious observance. In private, I have heard them joke about Vladimir II, comparing Vladimir Ilyich Lenin to Prince Vladimir, the Great of Kiev, who in 988 introduced Orthodox Christianity to Russia from Byzantium. Well, too, I remember a dispatch carried by Tass in November of 74, when the linen mausoleum reopened after a six-month shutdown for repairs, which sought to project a religious aura about linen. From early dawn, an endless line of power formed up across Red Square. From the granite sepulchre held sacred by the working people throughout the world, over the half-century, 77 million people have passed in a mournful and stern march by the sarcophagus where the genius of humanity lies in state. From this day onwards, new thousands and millions of people will be bringing worship to Lenin from all over the world. The propaganda overkill surrounding Lenin is the regime's compensation for the waning of ideological fervor, for behind the facade of communist conformity are puzzling contradictions and a dry rot of disbelief. Zealots exist, of course, but just as surely. Friends told me they knew officials in the Communist Party, Central Committee apparatus, at the very heart of it all, who privately mock their big bosses and are cynical about the system. Personally, I came to know Communist Party members who were close friends of distance like Alexander Solinshin and Andrei Sakharov, I met others who had discreetly had children baptized, held religious weddings and funerals in their families, or who publicly proclaimed their loyalty and privately swapped jokes at the party's expense. After all, Stalin's own daughter, Svetlana Aleyuvayeva, was a communist who underwent religious conversion and made friends with distant writers. One reason that her defection came as such a jolt to the West was that the cardboard image of the typical communist true believer left no room for skeptics, cynics, or out-and-out non-believers within the party. <clears throat> Our own political environment is not a good teacher. In the open political arenas of the West, those who join the party 
do so out of conviction, but in Moscow, a clean-cut young man will candidly say he wants to join to get ahead or to travel abroad, and without a party card, I don't stand a chance. Others explain party membership as a matter of family tradition and connections. Middle-aged people recall their patriotic fervor <clears throat> when they joined during the war. Still others, under some party recruiting quota in an army unit, factory, or institute, were extended a bid in effect to join the club. People join nowadays almost without a reason, one middle-aged party man said. The way people in the West go to church out of habit, not out of belief. For the ambitious, the party is the path to power, position, and privilege. Creed is secondary. It is not easy, however, for a foreigner to penetrate the political veneer of party members, or any Soviet officials for that matter, to discover who are the real believers and who are not. Radish communist, red on the outside, white on the inside, as one Russian called them. Most communists greet foreigners with such a dogmatic version of the party line that normal dialogue is impossible. Perhaps that is the point of the exercise, since real conversation in the presence of interpreters, guides, or other officials is too risky for them. I remember my own impatience with one man who repeatedly sounded a particularly hard line at a conference that I covered and my great surprise at learning later that this man had privately approached another American and tried to defect. His shrill politics had been a cover. Muscovites have a joke about the barrier foreigners face when they try to learn what Russians really think. According to the joke, an American scientist visiting Moscow asks a Russian colleague his views about Vietnam. The Russian replies with a verbatim, quote, from Pravda. The American inquires about the Middle East, and the Russian echoes a commentary from Izvestia. On other topics, the American meets the same results. Finally, he declares in exasperation, I know about Pravda and Izvestia and all those other papers, but what do you think yourself? I don't know, the Russian replies helplessly. I find I disagree with myself. But some Russians I came to know well told me how they and others made their bow to the Lenin cult and then found ways to turn it to their personal advantage. One linguist who had been abroad cited to me the excursions on the Leninist path, a favorite party slogan organized by the Soviet tourist monopolies to take Soviets to places where Lenin lived or had been active. In spite of the heavy doses of propaganda, he said these tours are very popular because people leap at the chance to travel to Germany, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Finland, and more rarely Sweden, Switzerland, France, Britain, or Belgium. Countries visited by Lenin but generally off-limits for most ordinary Soviets. An amiable young factory worker from a provincial city outside Moscow told me of cases where factory groups or other organizations from outlying cities would charter buses to make a visit to Moscow's Lenin Museum and then upon arrival tell their political guide they had no interest in the museum but wanted to shop. Usually, he said, they agree to meet late in the afternoon for a brief token visit to the museum to satisfy the formalities, but some groups don't go at all. That sort of thing satisfies everyone, my young acquaintance said. The guide gets paid for doing almost no work. The people get to shop in Moscow, which is very important and the party people at the museum and the factory get to write down that workers are studying Lenin. Making a bow to Lenin is a favorite technique of some liberal intellectuals who want to stretch the limits of the permissible in art or literature. Artists sometimes use Lenin as a subject to gain approval for experiments in modernistic techniques. One evening, Mstislav Rostropovich 
the cellist who had been kept from performing solo concerts for months after his defense of Alexander Solentsin appeared at the Moscow Conservatory playing a Hungarian suite by Aram Kachatorian. The program opened with an orchestral ode to Lenin, paving the way for the Rostropovich appearance. Something for the party and something for us, commented one music lover. For years, journalists, scholars, and writers have found that by citing Lenin prominently in the, their articles, especially the beginning and end, they can sometimes get otherwise questionable material past censors. A Western scholar, for example, spoke of seeking a book on Africa by a Soviet foreign affairs specialist, which he considered well done, except for periodic non sequitur quotes from Lenin. When my friend talked about with the author about it, the Russian candidly said, well, I have an editor, and he inserts those passages. A highly successful freelance journalist told me that he himself spent hours mastering Lenin's works to bracket ticklish essays to make them more palatable. In their formal education, Soviet students cannot escape a solid dose of party history, dogma, and Leninana, but very few develop any passion for mastering fundamentals of doctrine. Some intellectuals even consider it risky to know the Talmudic formulations of Lenin too well. I heard a scientist counseling his university-age son one night not to be too precise in reciting Lenin quotations, or this would lead to trouble with party officials who know Lenin's work far less well, and would be uneasy that a young intellectual might start quoting Lenin against them. You can know Lenin too well for your own good, the father cautioned. But this was an aberration. Most students groan about the boredom of party political courses, and practically boast about how quickly, after their exams, they forget Leninist catechisms. Their massive indifference, however, is almost never translated into public protest or even light-hearted pranks. With all the millions of Lenin images around the country, I have never seen or heard of one defaced or pockmarked with irreverent graffiti, or even decorated with an extra mustache. In that sense, Lenin is untouchable. Only once did I see an act of public sarcasm directed at the Lenin cult, and by that time I myself had become so conditioned by the Soviet political environment that I was immediately fearful for those involved. They were three young couples who had joined a crowd of foreign tourists and other Soviets at midday one May evening gathered to watch the changing of the guard at Lenin's tomb. The young Soviet KGB guardsmen went through their precise routine, a slow goose-stepping march from the Kremlin out to Red Square, with free arms swinging in wide rhythmic arcs and their bayoneted rifles balanced upright in the butts of their extended palms. And then, at the mausoleum, a series of sharp, quickly executed turns that smoothly replaced the two old sentinels with new ones. As the old guards were marching away in that same slow goose step, the three young couples began sarcastically chanting, Moldosti, Molodosti. At a sports event, this comes across as well-done boys. But in this case, with the giggling and obvious sarcasm, which I was close enough to catch, it came out more like, well, bully for you, a sacrilege at the Holy of Holies. I expected them to be marched off by some police officer, but evidently their shouts were lost in the general scuffle of the crowd as it broke up and they melted away. For many people, the antidote to the Lenin cult is humor shared with trusted friends, and often, as I noted, told after someone has cautiously shut the kitchen door or closed the blinds. For foreigners, the problem is that Lenin humor translates badly because so much of it consists of in-jokes that require close knowledge of Soviet history. 
personalities and the stilted idiosyncrasies of propaganda. One frequent target is the official practice of attributing all good things to Lenin, as in the little ditty which runs, winter came and winter and went, then came summer. Thank you, Lenin, for all that. Another quickie spoofs the slow gnearing about Lenin as the constant companion of the good communist. A mock advertisement promotes a triple bed for the happy communist couple because Lenin is always with us. A third satirizing the repetitiveness of revolutionary rhetoric urges a special gift clock which in place of the normal cuckoo bird popping out every hour has an armored railroad car like the one that carried Lenin across Germany into Russia with a little figure that pops its head out a window and says cuckoo. Other jokes, often very raunchy, satirize Lenin's supposed gentleness with allusions to his orders that people be shot or poke fun at an invented love triangle between Lenin, Nadezda, Kropaskaya, his wife, and Iron Felix, Dzerinsky, the Polish revolutionary who ran Cheka, as the secret police were then known. Still others make fun of the constant publicity about memoirs or recollections of people who claim to have seen Lenin in his lifetime and thereby to reflect his greatness indirectly. In one joke, a husband comes home to find his wife in bed with another man. The husband is outraged, not because his wife is having an affair, but because the other man is a bearded ancient. How can you have such an old man for a lover, bleats the husband. But he saw Lenin, says the wife in self-defense. Western readers rarely get a glimpse of Lenin humor because Soviet authorities are so intensely sensitive to anything written about Lenin in the foreign press that Western newsmen generally regard the subject as taboo. An Italian journalist, Giuseppe Josca, of Corriere della Sera, took a chance in early 72 and paid for it dearly. In an article on the Lenin cult, he wrote that the most common statue of Lenin, with his hand raised during a speech, gives the impression of someone waving for a taxi because taxis are so hard to get in Moscow, and he compared the cult of Lenin to the cult of Mussolini in Italy. That article triggered a sharp attack on Josca in the Soviet press, scores of threatening, insulting, and intimidating phone calls. The foreign ministry charged that Josca had made a sexual play for his government-provided KGB-cleared Russian secretary, which he vigorously denied and then fired the young woman for concocting the ac accusation to help the secret police frame him. The KGB frequently followed him and his wife and daughter closely and photographed them up close as a form of harassment. The foreign ministry pressured Italian ambassador Federico Cinzi to get Courier della Serva to withdraw Jaska. For months, both he and the paper withstood the pressures. Finally, in 73, Jaska departed Moscow. According to other Italian correspondents, his newspaper agreed to replace him with a politically less active correspondent. By and large, Russians are non-political people. Indifference is their main defense to the unrelenting party propaganda about Lenin and the unparalleled achievements of socialism. For all but a tiny fraction, state politics is too far beyond and above them to care about. Over lunch, ordinary people gossip about work, how to wangle a good travel assignment, who gets the best bonus, or the petty jealousies and illicit affairs in the office. Around the dinner table, they will argue about sports or the best site for picking mushrooms, talk about family, grouse about higher prices or shortages, 
calculate the black market rate for certificate rubles, debate the best place to go fishing, and with enough vodka, or in the right company, plunge into philosophizing about the tribulations of the soul, or start quoting Pushkin or Ler Lermontov, but except for the Jewish immigrations question, which was a constant buzz during my tour in Moscow, ordinary Russians said they did not usually talk much politics at home. The overdose of propaganda has turned them off. I knew an historian who was visiting the resort town of Kislovodsk on June 14th of 74, when Brezhnev delivered the main climatic address of the Soviet election campaign for the Kremlin. Tens of thousands of people were there out walking in the park. This man recalled, the weather was beautiful, warm and pleasant. All over the park, loudspeakers were broadcasting Brezhnev's speech. I watched the people, and for a couple of hours, not a single person stopped to listen to Brezhnev's speech. Under Stalin, everyone would have been listening. They would have been afraid not to. Under Khrushchev, people would have listened from time to time, because sometimes he would say something interesting. But now, under Brezhnev, it's just indifference. Massive indifference. This shows up in other ways, too. Bookstores all have well-stocked propaganda sections selling the communist classics. Works of Lenin, collected speeches of Brezhnev, Prime Minister Koshchin, and Chief Party Ideologist Mikhail Suslov. But that is not where cu the customers are. I would notice them clustering at the other end, poring over technical books, literature, or photo albums of old Russian churches. In mid-74, the big Melodaya record store in downtown Moscow was offering a special album of two LPs of a Brezhnev speech on youth for the bargain price of 50 kopecks. But when I was there, it was totally ignored by the young who were scrambling over singles of some Hungarian group doing Cecilia and Miss Robinson. The indifference is not directed so much at Brezhnev personally as the entire system of propaganda. People tune it out. Like many foreigners, I was immediately struck by the huge political slogans hung from the rooftops, draped from the bridges, and hotel balconies, or fixed in a fir firmament of lights downtown in downtown squares. Lenin is our banner. The party and the people are united. Communism will win. Lift high the banner of proletarian internationalism. Glory to the Soviet people, builders of communism, or simply glory to work. It is overwhelming to the newcomer, but Russians tuned it out. Once during a trip arranged by the Soviet foreign ministry, several of us Western newsmen were grimacing at the array of slogans in the city we were visiting. Later, a Russian translator for another correspondent approached me discreetly and advised in a low voice, I heard you talking about those slogans, but you must know that we Russians simply do not see them. They are like the trees. They are part of the scenery. We don't pay any attention to them. There is little the system can do about such passive resistance. What it does require from everyone, however, is participation in the political rites and rituals of communist society, much as the Russian Orthodox Church used to require proper observance of its rules, for if the church traditionally placed more emphasis on ceremony than theology, the Communist Party today places more stress on ritual than belief. Ideology can play one role or the other, either a simpler theory, a bespeckled Moscow scientist observed. It cannot be both. Our leaders use it as a symbol, as a way to affirm the loyalty of others, but it is not a theory they act upon. It is not live. On November 7th and May Day, the party turns Red Square into an enormous outdoor television studio for the march past of rockets and 
tanks of thousands upon thousands of gaily clad gymnasts who execute their figures and pause before the assembled party leadership on top of the linen mausole mausoleum to shout, Glory to the Communist Party of the Soviet Union! Glory, glory, glory! One man told me that it took daring merely not to shout as loudly as the parade organizers required. The portraits of Lenin and the living leaders, all looking 10 to 15 years younger than in real life, are carried aloft through the square, much as the icons of saints were borne aloft in religious processions through Red Square in centuries past. The parades are conducted with such Cromwellian seriousness and pomposity that Russians admit to being bored by it all. I knew people who had to be dragooned by party or trade union activists at their factories or apartment houses to participate. Some connived to get medical slips excusing them. My mother said it used to be an honor to march in the Red Square Parade before and during the war, a moustached young government worker remarked, but now it is just a duty they impose on people. The parades are but one element in the machinery of mass participation organized by the party to mobilize people. In spite of their indifference and their private joking about communism, and it works, Every fall, students, office, and factory workers are trucked off by the tens of thousands to help the farmers bring in the harvest, usually with modest pay. In spring, people donate an unpaid Saturday, a Sabotnik, to what is theoretically a voluntary mass spring cleanup. In fact, as one Russian friend remarked, most factory stores and other agencies simply get a day's unpaid work out of their labor force. Indeed, I noticed that in May 74, Pravda happily reported that 138 million people produced nearly 900 million rubles worth of goods and services on the spring Sabotniks, confirming that cost-free output was the prime interest in preserving the ritual begun by Lenin. People are constantly being drawn into all kinds of obligatory social work, making speeches to colleagues at work, volunteering for duty with the Drazhniki or auxiliary police vigilantes, serving as deshirdni or duty persons in some unpaid political function made to sell subscriptions of party newspapers and magazines to fellow workers, many of whom are simply ordered by superiors to, sus to subscribe, and others of whom have to buy Pravda and the heavier, undesired party propaganda journals in order to get the humor, health, or popular science magazines they actually want. Occasionally people told me there is a payoff for the most ardent volunteers, Tickets to show to some show or potevka vouchers to some vacation spot that are normally hard to get. The party needs countless volunteers because it operates so many mass political activities that in Moscow alone, one local paper reported it has a hundred thousand professional propagandists giving lectures. A short, dark haired Armenian teacher told me how she dreaded it when the party organizer at her institute informed her she would have to join the normal rotation and give a lecture on Lenin. I can't do it, she said in panic beforehand. But months later, when I saw her again, she was taking her turn routinely, no longer worried about being knowledgeable or interesting, but like the others, she said, parroting what was expected, no matter how dull and repetitive repetitious. At institutional celebrations like the 200th anniversary of the Bolshoi Ballet School, a former ballerina told me 
speeches praising the party's wise patronage of Russian ballet are obligatory. In factories, workers, too, have 15-minute political sessions in the morning or during lunch breaks twice a week, where the men take turns lecturing each other. I heard from one machine tool operator that at his plant, workers often did no more than read propaganda articles right out of the press. A former defense plant foreman described to me how he literally had to drag workers by their collars into monthly union meetings, heavy with political rhetoric. No one wants to go and hear those speeches, he said. If they did not hold those meetings during working hours, no one would show up. In our plant, we could keep the workers in the factory because they needed timesheets to show the gate guards to get out. When there was a meeting scheduled, we would just withhold the timesheets so they were forced to come to the meetings. I know a construction site where they hold the meetings on payday. Everybody comes to the meeting because they don't pay the workers until the end of the meeting. No ritual is more important to preserving the fiction of democracy and the illusion of political participation than the supreme Soviet elections every four years. Like many Westerners, I had mentally written off those elections as empty rituals a single slate, 99% of the vote, etc., without ever imagining a personal effort and ordeal of Soviet precinct workers until Vitaly, an intense young graduate student, told me his experience. He sounded strangely like a precinct worker in New York. He was personally charged with getting out the vote, literally 100% of the vote like some production target, and from that requirement, he said, came the phony figures. Vitaly had not volunteered, but was tapped for election work by the party bureau in his institute to take charge of 150 voters in a downtown Moscow district, mostly pensioners and intellectuals. He had to go see them several times, First, he went around door to door to tell them the date and location of the balloting and informed them of pre-election activities at their neighborhood red corner. This aroused little interest, he said, so he made a second tour to give them each a little pep talk. Finally, a week before the election, he went out to register them. One job was to provide people who were going to be out of town with absentee ballots enabling them to vote anywhere in the country on election day. Individual districts and candidates are of such little importance to voters that, for example, a party official like Georgi Arbatov, head of Moscow's Institute of USA and Canada, could run from a rural hill district near Baku, 1,500 miles away, where he was so unknown that local officials were unable to tell touring Western correspondents whether Arbatov had ever visited their district. But if the voters were going to be in Moscow, Vitaly said he would hound them steadily until the election. How, I asked, call them on the phone? Oh no, he replied, the phone is unreliable. No, I would go around and see them. And it was not a question by then of ideological appeals. Maybe they would tell me that they would vote only if the district party committee would help them get a new apartment, for which they had been waiting for years, or maybe they would complain that we had gotten poor entertainment at the Red Corner, the local party propaganda room, one complaint or another, and I would plead, please come just for me personally, so I can be free because I have to wait for you to vote. As poll watchers, we were not allowed to go until every one of our people came to vote, or until midnight of voting day. So, of course, you want your people to show up early. Still, some people would not come, and you would have to make up an, an excuse for them. Usually, it was unexpectedly called away on business. Out of a hundred people, you would get maybe five or ten who did not show up. It depended on the district, but it was impossible to get 100%. After all, some people fall sick 
or go away and some even die. I know sometimes election workers vote people who are dead and this is in Moscow the ideological center of the country where the ideological work is so is the strongest and where people are accessible so in the countryside it must be much worse but no one reports it that way and I have seen it happen that if a person picks up his ballot with only one approved candidate and then does not drop it in the ballot box which is out where everyone can see they would stop him and ask him to talk to the voting supervisor they would ask him to explain why he is not voting so practically no one challenges the system that openly if they are really so indifferent they just stay away the intellectuals we knew said with few exceptions that they went through the motions of participating in elections and other political activities despite their private disbelief or reservations you have to go to those political meetings but nobody listens said a plump leningrad school teacher in her late thirties it's the same old stuff we had to study in university sometimes there is a foreign affairs lecture on china vietnam some people knit i read or grade papers when the director of our school gives the lecture he tries to make it interesting he's a nice man a party member but a nice man but everyone is bored and nobody believes it what about the person giving the lecture Anne asked her even he doesn't believe what he's saying the older generation really believed in Lenin and they felt this was the way to build a new society but my generation doesn't believe it at all we knew its faults we have no religion so we have to have Lenin we can't change the system we have to just go on living I have my family and my children and she shrugged helplessly indicating that economically she could not afford the risk of open protest George Orwell so powerfully inserted double think into our political lexicon and it has subsequently been so overused that by now it has become a cliche drained of human content and meaning if you had asked me as i headed for moscow i would undoubtedly have said that orwellian double think was as much fictional exaggeration as reality or at worst one of the aberrations of the terrible period of high stalinism when people would say anything to save their own necks in more modern less brutal times I imagined that it was probably a bit passé, so I was hit doubly hard by the number of intellectuals who privately agonized over how routinely they practiced double-think and how pervasive was the practice. A curly-haired architect in his thirties who by his own account had been a model true believer in the enthusiasm of youth and only later became disillusioned by what he considered the cynicism of party officials told me of his unease at the facility with which he himself switched from private honesty to public hypocrisy someone will be talking before <clears throat> before a group and telling the same old nonsense and you will be thinking to yourself why does he talk that way the fool he knows better but when they call on you at one of those meetings to get up and speak you find yourself saying the same things talking the way our newspapers sound we have been taught long ago that this is the way one speaks in a meeting so that is how we speak to each other when we open our mouths in public nor can one easily duck out of political meetings no matter how much one chaffs at the enforced participation a lady mathematician told me that to skip the weekly Wednesday afternoon politogrammata political literacy session at her institute was to invite an official reprimand which is a serious matter sometimes we have 
outside lecturers and sometimes our own people have to give talks, she told me. I have to give a report, for example, about computers and the solution of problems that, thank God, it is not a political subject, but of course, I will have to talk about computers and socialist society. In our institute, the computers work very badly. I will have to lie about that, but what can I do? I was surprised, too, that some well-connected establishment writers, journalists, or scientists not only resented having to take part in the show of ideological conformity, but were willing to reveal their bitterness to a Western correspondent. I recalled one senior editor explaining to me it's very hard to describe a party meeting to someone who has never been to one. Five minutes before it begins, people will be out in the hall, joking with each other, making critical remarks, talking about how poorly the Arabs fight and waste all our military aid. Then comes the meeting, out go their cigarettes, and these very same people raise their hands and get up and denounce Israel and proclaim the victory of the Arabs, or someone talks about the third decisive year of the five-year plan and the others will listen solemnly or repeat the same slogans, knowing it's meaningless. It's a game, of course, but you must play it. I know urban intellectuals who worked off their frustrations at this enforced conformity by staging private parodies of political meetings or did takeoffs of the extravagant propaganda celebrations held in the Kremlin on big holidays. Still others, so disbelieving of all propaganda, were incredulous at the naive naivety of Americans. I remember listening to a Russian who had worked with the Soviet delegation at the Congress of World Peace-Loving Forces in Moscow in December of 73, and who told me with his astonishment at the earnest idealism of American del delegates. They take it so seriously, he said, they really believe that they can do something about bringing peace and influencing political leaders, and we are so cynical, nothing will happen, nothing will change. I don't mean that the Americans liked all the speeches because they did criticize the propaganda. They wanted something more practical, but what I mean is that they think they can actually affect politics. Are all Americans like that? Hearing such a frank admission of disillusionment from a member of the Soviet establishment brought up in a party family sharpened my curiosity about what Soviets actually believe in. Were their anti-regime jokes evidence of passive ideological defection or merely a harmless way of letting off steam? Were the private cynicisms a sign of fundamental disbelief or a more limited expression of frustration at the cant and pretense of Soviet public life without signifying some corrosion of rock-bottom faith in the system? Were establishment intellectuals a breed apart, so completely different, say, from party members, that their skepticism reflected the views of a narrow circle rather than a wider mood, or did the amalgam of ideology and loyalty include belief and disbelief side by side? After all, the Russian translator who had told me that the Russians paid no attention to the stilted party slogans posted on buildings had also told me quite firmly, our ideal, the ideal of socialism of people working for the common good is so much better than your profit motive, even if we can see that it is not being lived up to now. The historian, who had recalled the total indifference to Brezhnev's speech among vacationers in Kislovodsk Park, had cautioned me, don't mistake this as a sign of great dis dissatisfaction with Brezhnev either. There is no great grumbling about him. The factory foreman, who had recalled having to drag workers into the political indoctrination sessions by the scruff of the neck, and had retold some of the anti-party jokes 
that circulate in factories also said. Workers may sound off, criticize, but they only sound off against individuals. I never once heard anyone say that the party or the system is to blame. They may tell jokes about Khrushchev or Brezhnev, he went on, fixing his glasses and brushing a muscular hand back through his hair. They may draw caricatures of a man with a big belly and big eyebrows, Brezhnev, on the wall newspapers, or they may joke about the way Brezhnev speaks as if he had porridge in his mouth. Workers feel they can be more outspoken than intellectuals about these things because they have less to fear. They know they are needed in the economy. They see problems around them, but they blame their factory director or other officials, not the party. The system is not to blame, and Lenin, despite the jokes, is really above criticism. What he said goes, no stereotype, of course, would stand for 14 million Communist Party members. It is impossible to compare the attitudes of a long of a lifelong party man in the 60s who grew up under Stalin, experiencing the romantic communist fervor of the early years and struggling to survive under the terror of the 30s, with those of a young party member in his late 20s who never knew Stalinism firsthand and was born into an established system. Middle-aged communists who came of age when, Bresh when Khrushchev was debunking Stalin have a special outlook, more disillusioned and dissatisfied than either the older or younger generation. It also seemed to me that the farther one travels from big politicized cities like Moscow and Leningrad out into the, to the provinces, the more chance there was of encountering simpler people with less ideological pretension but perhaps more genuine ideals, the party apparatchiki, with their special privileges and the political pragmatism of organization men, are very different from rank-and-file workers and peasants who are selected for party membership. I remember an afternoon drinking beer on a train with a sunburned construction worker, a party man from the Ukraine, for him, the party had been a ticket to a job on the Oswan Dam in Egypt, where in three years he had piled up huge savings in certificate rubles and the right to spend them in special stores. When he got back home, he bought himself all kinds of luxuries, including a black Volga sedan like the bosses use. So party membership has paid off in material terms. On another occasion, I visited the home of a tractor driver in, in Uzbekistan, a highly honored hero of socialist labor. He, too, was a party man, but more than that, he came across as a strong, direct, uncomplicated man of the fields who believed in what he and others around him had accomplished, in what he had seen happen with his own eyes cotton fields created out of the semi-desert region known as the Hungary Steppe. Socialism had honored him for his work and provided him and his family with a modest, comfortable home. He now lived better than he had ever dreamed when he first arrived in that godforsaken region of Central Asia. His faith was in results rather than slogans and he seemed uninterested in comparisons with the outside world. The great mass of people, whether party members or not, do not think about ideology. They simply accept things as they are, a Moscow lawyer observed. It was an opinion echoed many times, among others by Gennady, the state farm accountant. He had himself become disillusioned, but he said, he was atypical because he was an intellectual. Ordinary rural people, by his experience, were savvy enough to discount exaggerated propaganda claims about Soviet achievements in the press, but they still believe in the system, he said. They know nothing else, and they accept it. Motives and attitudes are far more complex and skepticism more widespread among the intellectuals, bureaucrats, educators, scientists, 
economic managers and party apparatchik, who now compromise the comprise the largest component of the Soviet Communist Party, in spite of all the propaganda about its being the party of the working class. Beneath the surface, the party of party unity, Stalinist-minded dogmatists try to nudge the system one way while pragmatic-minded reformers seek to whittle down the impact of ideology and modernize the Soviet system with more rational methods of planning, management, farming, and sometimes even adopting more flexible cultural and political controls, but the weight of inertia and the party's jealous hoarding of its powers works against the reformers. It is impossible for an outsider to gauge and generalize about the ideological zeal and fidelity of people at the heart of the Soviet system, but in private, Soviets themselves, whether party members or not, privately talk of a loss of fervor, a rise of materialism and opportunism, a growth of corruption and moral decay. When you heard Khrushchev declare, we are moving forward to the victory of communism, you might not agree with him, but at least you felt he believed it, commented an important editor. Think of it. Here was a man who had been at the bottom of society. He had made his choice and joined the revolution, when it was not clear who would win. He took the risk. You felt he believed it. Even a man like Suslov, the ideological chief of the party, now in his seventies, probably believes, but these new ones in the Politburo, Polyansky, Muzorov, Shalepin, Grishin, you feel they are just cynical. What they want is power, pure power. How can you sense it, I asked. It is something you can feel. You hear what they say in their speeches. Watch their mannerisms. Listen to their voices. It is all done smoothly from habit, but with no feeling, no conviction. Russians often scoff at Westerners' attempts to divide party figures into liberals and conservatives. They insist that power clicks, cliques, career into career, party cliques, career ties, relations by marriage, and old established political loyalties or rivalries are more important for divining the flow of party politics than alleged ideological shadings. They make the party sound like Tamani. Hall, it is more important to know if someone was with Brezhnev in Dnepropetrovsk or the Virgin Lands in the old days than whether he is supposed to be a conservative or moderate, said a systems analyst who enjoyed dissecting state politics. Whose man is he? Brezhnev's, Koshchin's, Kirillenko's, Suslov's, that's what counts. As for ideology or propaganda, several Moscow intellectuals with friends working in the party central committee headquarters, the guts of the Soviet power apparatus, have told me incidents that illustrate the ideological dry rot among even such career communists. A scientist recalled that the director of his institute, one of the most important in Moscow, went to appeal for more funds from the science department of the Central Committee. He painted a bleak picture for Soviet science in his field and concluded by saying, it is not so good with us, meaning at the Institute. The director was taken aback. He told colleagues later when the high-ranking Central Committee official, in an unblinking contradiction to the glowing boast of official propaganda, replied, and just where is it good with us, implying the country generally? After a tough nuts and bolts discussion, the institute director came away amazed at the private realism of the central committee officials. They're no fools. They understand everything. A social scientist told me about friends in another central committee department 
who made fun of the political rigidity of Politburo members among themselves in their offices, a well-placed Soviet journalist described to me a walk in the woods he had taken with a senior official in the Central Committee's cultural department who began talking in despair about high-level corruption in the party. It is possible that the Pope and the Cardinals of the Church are venal Philistines, and the Church itself can endure. This official asked aloud, in other cases the maneuverings of supposedly moderate realistic party bureaucrats sound strangely like some American officials during the Vietnam War com compromising and submerging their private views in hopes of moderating policy, except that in Moscow there is no Congress, no press to leak to, no public opinion, less chance to affect thinking on top. Politically well-connected Muscovites spoke of an invisible but discernible split within the Central Committee structure. On one level, the leaders who hold the key positions of power, on another, the lifelong apparatchik who serve as aides to men of power but who gain a reputation for being too sophisticated, too educated, and worldly to be fully trusted with top jobs. Three different men who closely follow inside political maneuvering pointed out to me, for example, that when the Politburo leaders have a top-level vacancy to fill, they generally reach out to the provinces for candidates rather than promoting Moscow-based careerists who carry the taint of urban sophistication. In the Brezhnev period, Demok Hamid Kunayev, the party boss in Kazakhstan, a Brezhnev crony, joined the Politburo Konstantin Katushev, party boss in Gorky, who tapped to become National Party Secretary for relations with ruling foreign communist parties, Vladimir Dolky, who brought in from Krasnoyarsk to become National Secretary for Heavy Industry, Mikhail Solomonstev, who recruited from Rostov to become Premier of the Russian Republic. Almost class-like jealousies develop, I was told, between party technocrats and their candidati, PhDs, and the heads of central committee departments who have climbed through the party hierarchy as loyal organization men, protégés of some powerful party patron. One writer told me of several central committee friends who made fun of their department chief as a political Neanderthal and redneck from the provinces, mocked his proletarian habit of wearing a jersey or sweater under his suit rather than white shirt and tie, and yet literally popped to attention when he entered their offices. They had to show him respect, the writer said. This man had the power to decide what assignments they would get, whether they could take a trip to the West, when they would get a bigger apartment, far more than the Watergate White House of Richard Nixon. The party inculcates this instinctive ethic of loyalty to superiors. As one scientist explained to me on the basis of his contacts with party circles, a man with his own ideas is in difficulty because the essence of the game is to understand the desires of superiors, or better yet, to anticipate their desires. It is bad to get the reputation of being difficult to work with or being too knowledgeable, but loyalty is rewarded. I was assured by a rising and ambitious party journalist I met in Marmonsk. His personal gripe was that the bureaucrats who become local bosses through party connections are so often inept. They are plumbers at heart, he whined, but unless they make a scandal by having an affair with the party secretary's daughter, they never get demoted. Things may go downhill in their little factory or their theater, but the plumber simply gets transferred to another to another job, running a symphony orchestra or farmer's market. Being a party man, he is never demoted from the level of director, 
That's the way our system works. Yet within minutes, this same handsome, well-dressed young man, with a taste for flashy ties and pretty girls, was talking of his own promotion, a nice post for a man of thirty, and was appreciatively reflecting that the party controls everything, and how he, too, had good friends. The Tamani Hall element attracted him, too, and it is this down-to-earth quotient of post-office politics that is so often lacking in abstract notions of the typical Soviet communist. Once during the final Nixon-Brezhnev summit in Yalta, I fell to talking with a high-ranking party journalist who had seen enough of the West and had mingled enough with Westerners in his career to occasionally take the risk of candor. He was talking about the war and recalling how he had joined the party then when patriotic feelings were running high, and I asked him why people joined the party nowadays. They joined the ideology, he answered coyly. I gave him a skeptical look, disappointed at such a cliché response from him. What does the ideology mean to you? To me, it means our promise of a future paradise, he added with a grin, deliberately deflating his previous answer. It means a just society of equals with equal opportunity for all people. It, it means a minimum of work with a lot of time for each person to do what he likes. He paused, eyed me, took out a cigarette, and then decided to go on talking before he lit it. Certainly, that sounds idealistic compared with the politics we see every day. Our people see all kinds of mistakes and shortcomings and squabbling going on around them. But they think, okay, after a decade or two, the real line of the party will triumph. Someone came along and interrupted the conversation, but when the intrusion ended, I returned to the, his theme of idealism, sensing from something he had said earlier about American youth and the Vietnam War, that he regarded young Americans as more idealistic than the generation of his own grown children. There are idealistic people who are trying to build a better society in this country, I said, but my experience is that the real idealists are far from Moscow. I have bumped into them in places like Siberia and Murmansk, but in Moscow I find more cynics, more opportunists, more people out for themselves. You are absolutely right, he said a bit gruffly. It is more cynical in Moscow. People are more materialistic. You remind me of a French girl who told me once, We hate you Czechs and you Russians because you want the very materialism which we reject. It's true, our people are materialistic now. But you must understand why. It has been 56, 57 years since the revolution. People know that half a century has passed, and now they are saying, we understand about the revolution, and the civil war, and the war with the Nazis, and collectivization, and the first five-year plans, and the sacrifices that were required. We understand all that, but what are your promises? I have only one life to live, and it is short, so give me something for myself, not always for the future. So the revolutionary fervor is declining. It is only natural after so much time. And when he turned to talk to Watergate, then approaching its climax, I said that it was painful for Americans, but I think it is a good sign, a sign not only of troubles in America, but of a genuine political idealism that still works. In fact, I've been surprised in coming here to find that this is a cynical society by and large, and that by comparison, America is not such a cynical society after all, but an idealistic one. He looked at me, nodding thoughtfully in agreement, but said nothing for a moment. Then all at once, he surprised me by saying, I love America for its idealism, and quickly changed the subject. It would be wrong to leave the impression that this reflects a typical attitude among important party journalist. I don't know what is typical. I do know this was a genuine expression of feeling in private by of me 
by one quite liberal newsman at a moment of Soviet-American cooperation. At the other extreme, and far better known, is the image projected by Yuri Zukov, the graying, pudgy-faced, tweedy propaganda, cold warrior of Pravda, who comes closer to playing the role of true believer than any other prominent Soviet propagandist. He is Moscow's con counterpart to Joe Alsop, whom he sometimes quoted in outrage as proof of the dangerous influence of American right-wing circles. On periodic television broadcast from his book-lined office, Zakov, a man in his mid-sixties with two comfortable dashas, a large in-town apartment, and chauffeured car, often comes across as the voice of the hard-hat Soviet conservatives. Just before Moscow stopped jamming the voice of America, he delivered a warning to television listeners against listening to foreign broadcasts who were ideological intruders using the Russian mother tongue to spread falsehoods. In fairness, at a time when Soviet-American trade relations appeared to be blossoming, Sokov once sought to correct a widespread Soviet impression that American Lend-Lease in World War II consisted only of canned spam by listing tanks, trucks, jeeps, and other equipment sent by the Americans, but his more familiar position has been point man in the propaganda jousting with the West. After invasion of Czechoslovakia in 68, Zokov was a leading voice crying out about the dangers of Czechoslovak counter-revolutions and making insidious comments about Tito of Yugoslavia. During the long preliminary maneuvering on the European Security Conference, Zhukov accused the West of trying to blackmail Moscow and its allies into opening their borders to imperialist subversion as the price for a big East-West conference that Moscow wanted. In one startling blast, he accused most of the leading papers of the West, the New York Times, Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, London Times and Daily Telegraph, Le Monde and Figaro in France, and De Welt in West Germany of conducting a violent campaign against a detente. Some of his colleagues at Pravda told me they were embarrassed by that one. With the appearance of Alexander Selenson's Gulag Archipelago, Zokov made himself the spokesman of the Soviet silent majority, reading outraged letters from readers who responded to the book with the kind of gut patriotism and virulent anger that some Americans felt toward the peace movement during the Vietnam War. In person, he comes across much as he does in print. After the Gulag attack, he invited Western correspondents to come in and share his mail. One afternoon, he read us an anti silencin letter aloud, alternating between Russian and an accented hoarse but quite adequate English. He sidestepped the issue of whether he himself had seen Gulag, but he was stridently opposed to Selenson's effort to revive the issue of Stalinism. Zokov told us he was not reading the most vitriolic le reader letters on TV because he did not want to be accused of persecuting Selenson and Andrei Sakharov, the physicist. Had he gotten any letters supporting the two men, someone asked. Unfortunately not, he quipped in Russian. They were probably sent to the New York Times. Before we left, he posed for a group picture. A couple of days later, Zokov called John Shaw of Time Magazine to ask if John had received Gulag because he wanted to borrow the book for a few days. Shaw supplied it to him. By far my most revealing encounter with a Soviet communist however, was an accidental late-night get-together with a young apparatchik who reminded me at first of some budding young American political aide brimming with his own ideas and self-assurance, but whose 
conflicting attitudes eventually pulled together, for me, many elements of the puzzle about what makes the professional communist tick. Volodya was a man of the new generation, a tall, good-looking blonde with shoulders to match his classic Slavic features, and the kind of winning, gregarious charm that would have made him a successful life insurance salesman or politician in America. We met at a party after most of the people had left. It had been an evening of drinking and telling jokes. Volodya had come late and avoided the limelight, but with only a few people left, someone coaxed him to tell some antidotes. He was known as a raconteur as well as an effective party speaker, and within minutes he had lived up to that reputation. One theme of the jokes that night was party corruption. Volodoya's first one concerned two party secretaries who had just collected dues from a party members and were walking toward party headquarters with the money when one suggested they drop into a restaurant for a quick shot of vodka. One vodka led to another, then to Zakuski, Ors de Ordurs, more drinks, a meal, wine, a second bottle, cognac. By the time they finished, they had racked up such a bill that they had to use the party dues as well as their own money to pay the bill. As they left, one party man remarked, You know, I don't understand how other people can afford all this eating and drinking without being communists. Everyone enjoyed the joke, especially since a party man. In fact, the only party man present had told it. Everyone but Volyoda's wife, who was nervous about his telling anti-party jokes, especially with a foreign reporter in the crowd. But Volyoda was a proud man, determined to show he was unafraid, though he did ask someone to get a radio and turn up the volume before he went on with his stories. We all had another round of vodka, and he began the story about corruption in Soviet Georgia, where a real purge had been underway for two years. Everyone knew about government and party officials with illegal mansions, mistresses, extra cars, and illicit, <coughs> illicit businesses. Volodya set the scene beautifully with the party leadership gathered for private banquet the table laden with the most elegant and expensive dishes, several varieties of vodka and Georgian cognac. The toastmaster asked for permission to speak so that all could drink to the health of the party boss. I want to raise a toast to Oftondil Boya Vadez, intoned Volodoya. <coughs> with a suggested of leer. Not because he has four dashes, because, thank God, none of us has to sleep without a roof over our heads. I want to drink a toast to Aftandil Boavadez, not because he has five Volgas, because, thank God, it is fortunate, fortunate that none of us has to walk the street. I want to drink a toast to Aftandil Boavadez, not because he has a wife and three, three mistresses, because, thank God, none of us is a bachelor. I want to drink a toast to Oftandil Bois Vadiz, not because he has 10,000 rubles stashed away in the bank, because, thank God, none of us has to get along just on our salaries. I want to drink a toast to Oftandil Bois Vadiz, because he is a real communist. Volo, Volodia told it well, pausing to milk each of the punchlines, and it delighted everyone. Then somehow Volodia gradually slipped out of the role of joke telling. A bit later, I had a chance to ask him why he had joined the party after finishing a good technical education. Now, in his late twenties, he was already in a responsible party organizer's post. Let's say I have a friend, he replied by way of explanation. He and I graduated from the same institute together. We both have the same kind of grades and get similar jobs. I am in the party and he is not. 
along comes a promotion. Now, which one of us do you think is going to get it? He waited for me to nod at him and said, That's why I joined the party. What about ideology, I asked. By now, the radio was playing louder and other people were talking. No one believes in the ideology anymore, he said. No one needs it. Then, feeling he had overstepped himself, he pulled back. Well, maybe some believe, but not many. And why does the party want you if you have such an outlook? Because they know they've got you when you join. If you are not a party member, you can sometimes refuse to do what they want. You don't have to take assignments you don't like. But if you join, then you have to do what they say. Discipline, you know. But what about your feelings about the ideology? I have a reputation for understanding Marxism-Leninism. Very well, he smiled. I learned it well at the Institute. I knew it perfectly when they examined me for joining the party. When I make a speech, it sounds just right. But what I say and what I am thinking when I am saying it are two different things. We got off onto the twists and turns of the party line and sounding like some Western political analyst. He noted how many times the party line had changed, but it was always called the Leninist course. In Lenin's time, the party believed what Lenin sent down. In Stalin's time, the party believed what Stalin sent down. In Khrushchev's time, the party believed what Khrushchev sent down. In Brezhnev's time, the party believes what Brezhnev sends down. It is all the Leninist course, even though Khrushchev changed it 90 degrees from what Stalin said, and so on. The only thing you can say about the Leninist course is that it goes around in circles. It was an in-joke within the party. Volodya's wife was getting uneasy again and came over to urge him to go home, but Volodya was showing off and wanted to talk. He enjoyed being the oracle of the party in this group. Moreover, he wanted to prove his own personal independence of thought. I think, therefore I am, he said to me at one point. He was upset that party instructions were calling for induction of more workers and fewer intellectuals because he thought more intellectuals might make the party more liberal. He said he had read Gulag Archipelago and believed what Salinson had written about the Stalinist camps. He was worried that the Soviet Union was now returning to a political mood similar to 1931 when Stalin was carrying out collectivization and people had to conform. His prescription was flexibility to modernize the system. Almost imperceptibly, however, his tone was changing. For all his earlier cynicism and joking, it was slowly becoming apparent that he was a believer in his own peculiar way. If I had a chance, I would change things 45%, that is, nearly by half, he said, self-confidently. Things started to go wrong in 1920. 1918 objected a Russian friend who had been listening silently until that moment. No, 1920, Volodya insisted. When Lenin began to lose a bit of control, until then it was right. The revolution, the civil war, but after that it went wrong. If I had been there, I would have agreed that after the revolution, what we needed was one great collective, and he made a fist to keep the country strong. Otherwise, we wouldn't have made it, but that is not our situation today. We have to develop differently, give people more of a chance. In his light and jocular way, he was proclaiming a kind of loyalty and began to talk about what I will do when I get a post in the Politburo. His friend Sasha, considerably more liberal, more apolitical, and much less ambitious than he, was horrified and reproved him for aspirations of power that would corrupt him. Volodya, that's a terrible thing to hear you say that you want to be in the Politburo someday. If you get there, I'll shoot you. It sounded like student talk, but both men were nearly thirty and quite serious. No replied Volodya coldly. I won't let it happen. I will remember your words, and I'll make sure you won't be in a position to find me. It was a chilling instant. This sudden 
mercurial switch from joking and philosophizing to threatening a friend. It passed by Volo Dia's mood had changed. He began talking about what he knew of the actual story of the party's secret investigation of corruption in Georgia, secret as well as public trials of key figures. When I questioned the accuracy of a point or two, he disdainfully called me down, turning to his friend, Sasha, you know the sources. I presumed he meant inside party information, which Sh Sasha confirmed was a nod, but Volodya decided to drop the subject. We got into detente and trade relations in Europe. Imperceptibly, his pride in Soviet power surfaced. The Germans, he said, not your Germans, but our Germans, tried to threaten us over natural gas. Which gas, when? I asked. Oh, you don't know about the gas, he queried, exuding pride in his superior knowledge. His wife was worrying again, but he quieted her with, they don't know about these things. Then he snuffed out a cigarette and carried on. You know, we supply the GDR, East Germans, with gas for their industry. We supply it to them for, say, 43 kopecks, and then buy back other goods from them for a ruble. Economically, we lose, but this is not economics. It is pure politics. We hold on to them with the gas, they told us, for the development of our industry. We need you to double the amount of gas deliveries every year, and we told them we can increase the deliveries a bit, but not as much as you want, and they told us they would get gas from your Germans, even though your Germans were already getting gas from us. In other words, our Germans threatened us with your Germans, but they could not threaten us because we have, and here he began to turn his hand on an imaginary pipeline valve, we have the taps in our hands. That is very useful to have the taps in your own hands. We have the taps now for both Germany's and our hands. The more they take, the more we have in our hands. So they threaten us, the Germans, and to us such a threat was just a trifle. We stopped deliveries for a while, and they understood what it meant. This was evidently the version propagated at internal party meetings. Volodya moved on to how the Soviet Union had handled difficulties with Hungary, Poland, and Czechoslovakia. 2. Only three times have the East Europeans challenged us, threatened us, he said. Once in Poland, and then Gomułka came in. Once with the Germans, what I just told you, and once in Czechoslovakia. And we all know how that ended. What about Hungary in 56, I asked. That was not the same kind of threat, he replied without explanation. I did not see his logic, but I saw that here, side by side, with his cynicism and his joking about corruption and his seemingly genuine desire for internal reform, was a young man who prided himself in his real politic, who was driven by personal ambition for a career of power and influence, and who, flattered by the same sense of superiority and inside knowledge that being a party organizer and careerist gave him. He believed in the roots and goals of revolution, and though he thought the party had gone off track under Stalin, he was immensely proud of the powerful nation that Stalin had built and the empire that Stalin had gathered under the shield of Muscovy. He was prepared to do the party's bidding as he rose up the ladder, unless he could use his party connections to wriggle out some unattractive assignment, and he was prepared to pay constant lip service to the ideology in which he professed not to believe. Indeed, he was rather proud at his skill in masking his private views and his reputation as an able party speaker. In essence, he was an ideal organization man, he kept his cynicism and liberalism to himself and his close friends. I could imagine his maturing over the years as a party man, his disbelief subordinated to his ambitions, his nationalistic pride in Soviet power growing along with his ego, kicks at being a privileged insider, and somewhat his threat to remember the conscience-stricken words of the friend who found his ambition too frightening. 
<coughs> for Volodya, as well as for some of the Soviet intellectuals, I admit the quintessential Soviet gesture is what the Russians call the fig v karmen, the sign of the fig, the thumb thrust irreverently between the second and third fingers in a clenched fist, meaning roughly nuts to you or screw you, or stronger depending on the force of the gesture and the circumstances, but v karman means in the pocket of one's pants, in other words, making the dis defiant little gesture secretly, privately, out of sight, the urge to defiance and thus overcome by fear and by the pressure to conform, and so the protest is hidden in the pocket, figuratively speaking. So belief or non-belief in ideology is not the vital issue, so long as the individual submits and does not challenge ideology openly, the system prevails and along with it the ideological rituals which affirm and legitimize and perpetuate it.